So this is the InterCloud Fabric northbound APIs for business. Is everybody in the right place? All right. I'm John McDonough, InterCloud Fabric Technical Marketing Engineer. And we only have a half an hour, so I'm not going to spend, this deck has a lot of information in it, so I encourage you to download it. It's a, it's a full set of the APIs that we have available for InterCloud Fabric. Um, and also I have a, uh, I think I added on the end, we'll see when we get to the end, an appendix for uh, JSON and uh, XML. So if, if you're new to JSON or if you're new to XML and, and how it's utilized in these, in these REST APIs, uh, that, that appendix is there for you to be able to, to uh, reference from. <clears throat> so getting to know the latest REST APIs and their capabilities for InterCloud Fabric, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope that most of you have some short-term memory issues because these APIs are going to change in the next release. So remember them now, forget them in August or September because they're going to be different. Um, will still support backward compatibility, so they'll still work. But just so you know, they're gonna, these ones are going to be, they're going to change and they're going to augment, but the ones I show you today will, will continue to work uh, till some point, till some release, I suppose. Who's tried InterCloud Fabric? I, I asked, oh, you tried InterCloud Fabric, okay, you've tried it? All right, excellent. So we have some, we have some tries of InterCloud Fabric. The last session, we didn't have too many triers. Actually, we had, I think, a, a grand total of zero. Um, but if you want to try InterCloud Fabric, InterCloud Fabric can be downloaded from Cisco.com. It comes with a 60-day license and supports up to 10 VMs running on Azure or running on Amazon or split their, their uh, you know, across. So you can have one on Amazon and nine on Azure, whatever you want to do. It's only going to count running VMs. So from a licensing perspective, VMs that you have running in the provider cloud are counted for that hybrid cloud unit uh, component. Um, so you can download it for free from Cisco.com. If you set up an Azure account, and that was the last session I was at, so if you're at the last session, you know how to do this already, or you can download DevNet 1120 to show you how to set up accounts for InterCloud Fabric on Amazon or on Azure. But if you set it up on Azure, Azure will give you a 30-day, $200 credit. It works with all features of InterCloud Fabric. Amazon free tier does not. So if you do the Amazon free tier and you want to try to work with InterCloud Fabric and you go to set it up, InterCloud Fabric will not be able to instantiate a cloud connection to Azure using their free tier. So, or to Amazon using their free tier. But Azure free tier works perfectly with InterCloud Fabric. If you're here for a number of days and you have some time and you want to try out the DevNet sandbox, you can try out the APIs that I'm talking about today. There's a guided, I, I think it's a 60 minute lab where you can go through uh, provisioning VMs, migrating VMs, um, creating uh, cloud, um, excuse me, catalog entries for the, for the VMs, but um, you can try the APIs out. Also, um, Cisco dCloud, if you have access to it, the latest and greatest version of um, InterCloud Fabric, I know this says now supporting InterCloud Fabric release 221, However, that's not the case. It should be by like next Monday or, or, or sometime next week that we support the latest release in dCloud. If you're not familiar with it, go to dcloud.cisco.com and if you have access to it, even better. And actually, in that dCloud environment, I didn't mention this last session, um, you're making an actual connection to Amazon. It's not a virtualized environment like many dCloud labs. This is legitimate. You're making a connection to Amazon. Um, so if you have an opportunity to try that, do that as well. Just real brief on these slides, Cisco sees InterCloud as the connection of clouds, like the internet's connection of networks, the InterCloud is a connection of clouds. InterCloud fabric is that thing in between with all the dots and lines connecting the clouds together, doing your network extensions from your data center to the provider cloud um, that you choose. We work with Amazon, Azure, and a number of other cloud providers like Dimension Data, uh, Telstra, um, Portugal Telecom, British Telecom, to some extent we're working with these cloud providers. But we have about um, 60 cloud providers who want to be part of InterCloud Fabric, and that 60 cloud providers represents about 350 uh, data, centers, data centers globally. So InterCloud Fabric is the software that is the connection mechanism for all these clouds. 
high-level overview. You have something that runs in the, in the private side. You have something that runs in the provider side. The cloud connection that gets deployed or the cloud connection that you make is represented by two virtual machines that are virtual ethernet modules, one running in the private enterprise, one that we push up to and run in the provider enterprise or the provider cloud, excuse me. Between those two, we create a secure layer two extension. You put VMs out into the provider cloud and those VMs are on your VLANs that you've extended. So if you extend VLAN 700 from your private side to the provider side through InterCloud Fabric, those VMs will have an IP address on VLAN 700 and will communicate with VMs on VLAN 700 as if they were layer two adjacent. That's what InterCloud Fabric does. It does it securely um, through this secure layer two extension and it's worth taking a look at. But I don't want to take up too much time on the, on the architecture We'll talk about the APIs. There's some core services that come with InterCloud Fabric, networking, security, VM portability, which is really VM migration. We can migrate VMs from the enterprise to the provider, from the provider back to the enterprise. We can also instantiate directly in the provider cloud, and when that VM is instantiated in the provider cloud, it comes up on your enterprise network and gets an IP address from your enterprise network, and it is layer two adjacent in that respect. So, not a lot of time to spend on these, but definitely download the slide deck for, for this session, DevNet 1128, and take a look at it. So, InterCloud Fabric REST APIs. So, who's familiar with REST? All right, so, all right. We're good there. What can you do with InterCloud Fabric REST APIs? Full VM lifecycle APIs. So, what I should have said is, what can't you do with InterCloud Fabric REST APIs? And there are some things you can't do. So that's why this slide is what you can do. And remember earlier I said that the APIs are going to change. And the reason they're changing is that in the next release, the next full release, not a maintenance release or anything like that, but the next full release, every aspect of InterCloud Fabric will be supported by the API. So if you're familiar with something like UCS Manager, where if it's in the graphical interface, it's in the API. With InterCloud Fabric, we're sort of halfway there, and by the time we get to our next release in the summer or fall of this, uh, this year, we should have full API um, coverage for, for InterCloud Fabric. So for VMs, you can do instantiation, migration, power, and termination. What's and there's a few other things you can do there, but what's good about that is that if I have uh, VMs where I want to spin them up or turn them down at particular points in time, like we're, we're doing a, a demo for Elasticsearch uh, using InterCloud Fabric and storing data out in the provider cloud and having some front end compute in front of that data, when we're not using those VMs as part of InterCloud uh, or as part of the Elasticsearch, we use the APIs to shut them down. So we're not incurring cost in our, from the cloud provider for running those VMs. But the idea here is there is that whether those Elasticsearch VMs are running in Azure or Amazon or some other cloud provider or spread across cloud providers, because my VLANs would be extended to all the cloud providers regardless of, um, of you know, location or, or the cloud connection, I should say. Um, I write one script to turn that that VM on and one script to turn it off regardless of where it resides. So if that VM resides today in Amazon but I migrate it over to Azure or I change it to some other uh, Cisco cloud provider like Dimension Data, the script still works because it is the same consistent API call for that, um, for the VM uh, lifecycle or for the power of that VM, uh, power management of that VM. So it's REST architecture and I'm going to say it's REST-ish, so if you're familiar with REST, um, we're breaking some rules in this version of the API. We're not, we're, we're doing some creation in a get. We're doing some queries in a get. In fact, we're doing everything in a get. So I apologize for you purists out there. It is not a pure API. We've latched onto the get, and we put all the data on the URL or the URI. So I apologize, don't get mad at it. It's the way it looks now. It's going to get better. For the next, the question is for the next version, will it be fixed? And the answer is yes. For the next full release version, codenamed Diablo, right, internally, it's very 
Um, very cool. Codename Diablo. That next release coming out summer, fall of this year, the APIs will be, um, will be restful and not rest-ish. All right? So just, all right. So the API, oh, you guys know what rest is, so don't worry about it. We won't, we won't do this. But get, we use the get, the get method. We don't use any other method. Um, so all the Cisco Intercloud Fabric Director REST APIs are gets. Uh, the URI structure for, for every REST call is the, exactly the same, right? Well, minus some optional components, but it's exactly the same. You have a format type as one of your operators. You have an op name as one of your operators, and you have an op data. So here's the deal. Format type, by default, it's JSON. If you're, not using, if you're using XML, you have to say format type equals XML. If you're not, you can leave it out. Op name is always required. It's the operation you're doing, whether it's a migration operation, it's a change password operation, a user creation operation. The op name is always required. Op data, you can see, is a, is a JSON uh, format of, uh, at the end of the your URI there, is only required if you need data for that operation. I know you guys are like, wait, this is not restish at all. This is, all right, thumbs down, whatever. It's changing. It, we're, we're doing it right with the next release. But the way the op data works is that um, you're going to put your operational data in that uh, component of the URI and push it through, and it's going to uh, do the um, parsing of the data that comes across. So from a um, perspective of you know, using those operands, so here's, here's an op name called user API get my login profile. If I issue this call, I only need to have op name in there. I'm going to get back JSON as the default. If I want XML, I have to say format type equals XML in my URI, and I'll get back XML from that call. Um, the only thing to point out here for op data, and you know, I know that I got a lot of data on this slide, and you can download these, but for op data, it's not the attribute name for that name value pair. It is actually the word param zero, param one, param two, param three. Um, again, I understand that's not completely restish or restful, but what you'll do here and what you can see is that we have op data param zero for this operation of, of an instantiation of a VM in AWS from a catalog entity. Param zero is the name of the catalog entry Param one is the virtual data center that we're putting the, uh, that we want to instantiate this VM in. And then param two is a component um, for that. So it's a parameter, or the, the way the parameters are in the URI, it's param zero, param one, param two, and then the value for that parameter, not the actual name of the attribute that you're, that you're um, creating. So, for all the Cisco APIs that we have, whether it's um, the UCS Manager API or the Nexus 1000 API or the, in this case, the uh, Intercloud Fabric Director API, they all work in a different methodology for your authentication and then, and then um, something for, for continued operations within that, within that environment. For Intercloud Fabric Director, if you're familiar with UCS Director, you get a request key. And this key is associated with your user account. So it's the REST API, or excuse me, the XCLAPIA request key. You have to get this key and create a header and put this key in your header, and that way successive calls will use this key as a method for your author what authorization and what you can do in that account and in that environment. So you call op name get rest key, and these by the way are all case sensitive. So get rest key with a capital G, not going to work. So op name get rest key, user equals my username or whoever's username, and then password equals the password of that user account will return that user's rest API key, create the header xclapia request key with that value, put it into all your successive requests, and, it, and that's how you'll interact with uh, UCS, or excuse me, with Intercloud Fabric um, API. So I have slides and slides and slides of operations, not that we're gonna to get to them today, but please, again, download this, uh, this presentation and get them. But um, 
For user operations, I did want to point out some things that if you were to look at the user guide for the API on Cisco.com right now today, it wouldn't have this information in it. The information it has is sort of ambiguous um, when it comes to creating user. One of the parameters, and you can see from the example calls that I have here, param um, six is the group that the user belongs to. For a regular user, if you want to put them in a service end user group, the value is regular. If you want to pick, create them as a group admin, the value is group admin. If you want them to be an admin that they're, that they're in, I'm sorry, the role um, for param five, if you want them to, that would be the group as param five. Look at param six. For param six, group admins and users, regular users, belong to groups. So it would be a quoted group name from your environment that you've created. Admins don't belong to groups. So it actually has to be the word null. The word null goes in that, in that call. It's not completely, um, it's not explicit in the user, in the user guide. So I just want to key on a couple of these different operations. So we have more user operations, uh, resetting passwords, getting login profiles, deleting users. Again, this should be a REST uh, in, in a delete method, but in the, UC, or in the Intercloud Fabric Director API, it is the, it's a get with the user that you want to delete. Catalog operations, so we have some catalog operations to get all the catalogs or to get all the catalogs for a specific, um, for, for a specific group. Now from a role-based access point, your user that you're making this call as, if, and you'll see in this slides here I have who can make that call, whether it's an admin or an end user or both. When it's an end user making the call, the group that they belong to will be the catalogs that are returned. If they don't belong to any group, they won't get any catalogs back. If they don't own any VMs, they won't get any VMs back. So everything that they do or they see from an end user perspective will be based on the, the entities that they have available to them. I know it's not shocking, but just so you're aware, the end user can make that call and they'll only see what they would see through the graphical interface of what they have availability of. Um, when you create, when you make your API calls for InterCloud Fabric, you may be creating something out in the provider cloud, or you may be um, getting information about your private cloud. Uh, we don't create anything in the private cloud. We create nothing in the private cloud uh, through the APIs. The only thing that we do if we, if we instantiate something in the private cloud is because we migrated a VM from the provider cloud back to the private cloud and we are instantiating that VM in the um, in the private cloud, but we don't have any create, create operations in the private cloud. So the one I wanted to show you here, all right, we have this one API call, it's intercloud user API get static list by name, it's the very top one here. The operational data that you put into that call is that actual word, data store list. So this call that I have at the very top here where param zero is the word data store list, that is the actual word. So in all the other examples in here, it's sort of like, you know, example data. In this one, and I have it, an arrow going to it, this actual word to get that information back. So what we provide from an, uh, an API standpoint right now in InterCloud Fabric is all the information you need to be able to instantiate VMs, to manage VMs, to migrate those VMs, whether it's to the provider cloud or whether it's back to the enterprise cloud. So that's all the, the information that you're gonna see here from these different cloud operations and user operations and migration operations. Um, networking operation, again, it's not a full set of APIs. We enable the, we, we enable the creation of, of static IP pools. We enable the creation of tunnel profiles. Not the creation of a tunnel, of, a, of an intercloud fabric tunnel, but the creation of a tunnel profile all the things that I'm talking about today, Wednesday morning, 8 o'clock, 8 to 10, I have a breakout session. It's, it's a BRK CLD two, 2003. I'm spending two hours talking about InterCloud Fabric and the relationship to these components. So, and, I'll, and I'll speak about the APIs there as well. But to give you a nice overview of what, of what we have available, tunnel profile is the type of tunnel, but not an actual tunnel that you can create through the API. 
So some more network operations, uh, service request operations. So everything that you do in InterCloud Fabric is a service request. If you instantiate a VM, it's a service request. If you migrate a VM, it's a service request. If you terminate a VM, it's a service request. So everything that you do as a user through the API or through InterCloud Fabric is a service request. Through the API, if you want to get those service requests back and get the log of that service request, we have a couple of operations for service request um, uh, retrieval uh, through the API. Now, the, the, the point of these APIs actually is if you saw InterCloud Fabric, we have two interfaces. We have an admin interface and we have a user interface. The admin interface, um, I, or I should say the user interface, excuse me. The user interface is completely API drivable. So if as an enterprise you already have a portal and you don't want your users to go to the InterCloud Fabric user portal to instantiate their VMs, you can totally bypass that interface and use these APIs to integrate the user component into InterCloud Fabric. So think about the APIs that we currently have in InterCloud Fabric as replacing the user portal, not the admin portal, even though there are some admin calls in here, but replacing the user portal. Skip that one. VM operations. So these are the ones that you'll probably key in on the most for the APIs we have right now. You can get all the VMs that belong to you as a user or as an admin. You can see all the VMs in your environment. You can get a VM summary, so understand based on the VM ID what that summary is or what that VM is, is utilizing from a network connection and, and um, where it lives, what virtual data center it's in. Now I want to point out in these slides for the, for the VM operations, the parameter that I'm calling the VM ID is the VM ID as InterCloud Fabric knows it, except for one. In one call, the InterCloud user API onboard VM, where we can take a VM that's running on Amazon, and this is Amazon only, and bring it into InterCloud Fabric, so we can ingress that VM in. The VM ID that we're talking about in that one is actually the instance ID on um, Amazon. But if you look at the user guide online, it's going to say VM ID, but we're talking about the instance ID on Amazon. So you can, through the, uh, the APIs, you can provision VMs, you can onboard a VM. So if, you've, if you want to bring a VM into your environment, and I talk about this on my Wednesday uh, uh, breakout session, you can do that through the API. You can migrate a VM from the enterprise to the cloud, and you can migrate an, uh, a VM from the, from the cloud to the enterprise. And these are just going through, the, the listing in these slides is the different values that you would have. If it's not a, straight, a straightforward value, I'm calling out exactly what it is. For example, the remove source, it's the actual word true or the actual word false, if you want to remove the source VM. Power off, power on, reboot, terminate. So those VM operations are there. And again, going back to the scripting aspect of, of InterCloud Fabric, if I want to shut down a VM on Azure and I want to shut down a VM on Amazon, all I need to know is the VM ID, pass that request to InterCloud Fabric. InterCloud Fabric makes the call with the respective API to that cloud provider. And if it's not Amazon or Azure, if it's a different cloud provider that we support, like Dimension Data or um, Telstra, that call is going to go to the InterCloud Fabric provider platform that's running in the provider cloud and, and manage the operation. So essentially, you don't need to know who the cloud provider is you just need to issue the call with the correct VM ID, and it will do that respective operation on that VM. All right. So, anybody have any questions on? Inter I only had a half hour. Anybody have any questions on InterCloud Fabric APIs? All right. The rest of the of uh, Cisco Live. If you have the opportunity to go see these sessions, please take it. You know take a, a glance at this slide and, and what you would go to. Um, again, Wednesday morning, 8 to 12, or 8 to 10, excuse me, not four hours of me, only two. Um, or you can go to World of Solutions and see our demo. Also, if I am your sp favorite speaker so far, which I don't know how I couldn't be, but if I, if I, if I am, you know, John McDonough, John A. McDonough, um, and then my favorite speaker, CLUS. Some feedback, all fives across the board. If it's not gonna be all fives, don't do it, just like in your hotel evaluation. 
right? The hotel says, call us first. So if you don't think I'm that good, talk to me first, and I'll tell you why I am better than you think I am. Um, and uh, continue your education. The, the dev nets, the walk-in labs, the one-on-ones. Meet the engineer tomorrow from noon to four. I met Meet the Engineer. If you didn't have enough of me already, and on Wednesday, we could come and talk as well there. And thanks for coming. And at the end of this slide deck is a JSON and XML reference in case you need to be uh, back up on what JSON or XML is. And so if you download this slide deck, then you also get some the JSON and XML reference slides. Thanks a lot, everybody.